Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today I have a very special guest on, Jade Tita. He is a he has been in the fitness industry for over 25 years. He's an integrative physician, entrepreneur, and author in metabolism and personal development. He completed his undergraduate training at North Carolina State University, got a bachelor's degree in biochemistry, and then went on to study at Bastyr University in Seattle, completing his doctorate in naturopathic medicine. And he's also currently getting his PhD in psychology. So super smart. Looking forward to having you on, Jade. And uh, thank you for coming on today, man. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation, man. I off air, I always, whenever we, we have this conversation, it's always, I always have an idea of what somebody's name is and then ask you what it is. And I always end up messing it up. So I did, I, did I say it right? Like, like you, you said, we talked about you, you did. And actually I'll share this cause it's funny. I'll share this with the listeners, but so my name is uh, T E T A my it's the correct pronunciation. I'm Italian background. The correct pronunciation is Teta, obviously Italian. The problem is that means tit in Spanish. And so <laughs> I think uh, we pronounce it Tita cause I think my grandparents, they came over, they understood that when they came to America and they were like, maybe we need to change the pronunciation. So we go by Tita, but uh, I also am answer to Teta, but you said Tita and I appreciate that. Yep. And then again, just the same <laughs> conversation we had off air, like my last name, people get it wrong too. So always, always want to ask, like you said, to make sure you get it right. But uh, yeah, no, that's a cool little background there. Also. Yeah. So again, looking forward to having you on, like I said, too, off air, I always like, anytime I bring somebody new on, I always like to just go over backgrounds. Maybe if you just want to hit on your background and like the fitness industry and, and whatnot, and then we'll roll from there. Yeah, you said 25 years. It's actually 35 years when I really break it down. And the reason why uh, is because I'm 50 years old. So people go, all right, 35 years. How? What do you mean? You were doing this at 15 years old? And you're basically, yeah, I was doing this at 15 years old. I say that because that's the first time I got paid to write a program for someone or train somebody. And so personal training is what I started out doing. And obviously, I got into that like a lot of young teenage kids. I got into that for football and wrestling. And then I started writing programs uh, for people as early as high school. My undergrad degree at NC State University was biochemistry. Obviously, I got inter interested in training, got interested in nutrition, decided I want to study what goes on actually in the body. And I paid my way through school with personal training. And then I got into a sort of a one of those crossroads moments in my life. I was on my way to medical school at East Carolina University, traditional medical school. And I had an advisor there, and I remember he showed me the curriculum for medical school. And there was not one course in nutrition, not one course in exercise. Now, this is back in 1992, right? Or no, 19, maybe 1995, 96, and no psychology. And these were all the things that I was interested in, Jeff. So I was like, no psychology, no nutrition, no exercise. And I went through one of these moments where I was like, oh no, what am I going to do now? Not that there's anything wrong with drug and surgery, but uh, I just didn't want to do that. I knew I wanted to keep doing lifestyle medicine. And I found a little known university at the time called Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington that trained naturopathic doctors. Now at this time, this was not, today all, all the rage is functional medicine and alternative medicine. Now this is 1997 uh, that I'm starting at this university. This was considered quack medicine, witch doctor medicine. And it still is to a large degree. And as a matter of fact, I get called that on occasion, witch doctor, quack doctor. And I oftentimes uh, take it as a compliment because it was a very conscious choice. And uh, anyway, I got training in as a family care physician. Um, my license is in California and in Washington state. Naturopathic doctors aren't licensed in all states. And you can think of us as your family care doctor who specializes in lifestyle medicine, which of course now naturopathic medicine is all the rage. Functional medicine is all the rage, but it certainly wasn't uh, when I first started out in this uh, business. And since then I started a company. I never really got out of the gym, to be honest with you, Jeff. I, I kept doing it. I was in the clinic and I opened up a gym right next to the clinic, a, a boot camp and a gym. And I started an online company and I've just continued my education, written what, eight books now and deep into psychology now. And I've just continued to educate myself. And the, and the final way I'll wrap this up is uh, something that I think some people might find shocking and maybe an embarrassing admission. But the bottom line is after all these years, after all my education, I still honestly, man, do not think we know that much about metabolism. We know so little about what we're obviously doing here. And it's it, it really shows up in the fact that if you look at the stats in terms of just, let's just look at weight loss, a narrow aspect of metabolism. And you look at the stats about how successful people are. Now we're talking about your average uh, person, not these people like you and me who've been doing this stuff 
since we were kids, probably. The stats are 90% failure rates after one year, uh, 95% failure rate after two years, basically 99% failure rate after three years. And, and by the way, in the research, they define that as a loss of 10% body fat maintained over a year, two years, or three years. So either people are not able to lose the weight and or they're not able to maintain it. And something in my mind is wrong with our model that this failure rate is so high. And we still don't really know uh, what is what uh, when it comes to this, if we're really being honest. No, I, a ton of great information in there. I, a few things that came to my mind. I want to hit on the functional nutri- uh, functional medicine side of things too. But you, you mentioned, hey, we just we don't know a, a lot about metabolism. You think there's a lot that we need to know. So I guess a few things off of that. What are some things that like, and you said the model's messed up there. What are some things there that kind of off the top of your head do you feel like are not right there on, on that side of things? One of the things we can just say, we know for a fact, it's just physics. It's solid science. There's no arguing that calories matter, right? So we know that. However, in the real world, we realize that the metabolism does not act like a calculator. So it doesn't have this sort of calculator type of activity that's going on. It seems to adjust. It's not linear. It's not predictable. It's not stable. And so, yes, while calories are a solid science, we don't know how that actually translates uh, once those calories uh, enter our metabolism. We know a few things about that, by the way. We know that the metabolism compensates. We know, for example, that uh, people who are trying to exercise to lose weight and burn calories, that it's not an additive type of effect that happens. For example, if my resting energy expenditure is 2,000 calories and I burn 300 calories in a workout, then everyone goes, okay, you burn 2,300 calories. The truth of the matter is that what happens after several weeks of training is that my body starts to budget the calories at rest. And so I'm no longer burning 2,300 calories. I'm burning 2,000, even though I'm doing more exercise. So we know that happens. We also know that the metabolism uh, responds with increased hunger, increased cravings, and unpredictable and unstable energy in a vast majority of people who try to overexercise. So we know that. So we have this idea of, oh, it's just calories in, calories out. But then we see all these compensatory mechanisms, and then we have to go, well, what drives that? Now, right now, we use a pretty amorphous term, a a general term, like, oh, this is our hormones. And certainly, hormones are playing a role here, but that's just a way of saying it's not just calories, it's hormones. Yes, but what hormones? What are we talking about here? And so there's a lot of gray zone in this, and we know that the metabolism is an adaptive, reactive system. What I will throw out there and posit is that the major thing that metabolism is doing, what is it adapting and reacting to, is stress, or maybe better described as metabolic tension. And so really what metabolism is, my guess is it's not a calorie counting device. It's not a hormonal chemistry set. What it is, it's a stress barometer. It's almost like a satellite that has a dish facing out towards the environment and a dish facing in towards the body. And it basically picks up all these signals from outside and it picks up all these signals from inside. And it tries to integrate that information and plot a course back to homeostasis or balance. And so what metabolism is really doing is it's a survival mechanism and it survives by measuring stress and responding to stress. And from my perspective, perhaps, and by the way, this is a guess, but perhaps When we start looking at metabolism this way as more of a stress barometer, a reactive and adaptive system to stress rather than just calories and hormones, we will start to have some answers for why it does what it does. Yeah, super inter- super interesting stuff. And this is why I wanted to bring you on today was to, to talk about metabolism. Um, exactly. So I, I do want to kind of park the in-depth metabolism talk here for just a little bit, because I want to come back to it. That was what we mainly wanted to talk about today. But I'm curious to hear on your end, is there anything that you would like to find out more about with the metabolism? Is there like anything specific um, there on that, that like you either you see it like heading that way, or you would like to see it head that way? Or is there anything that you're trying to look uh, at specifically? Yeah, I think the two most exciting areas, and there's probably three here, exciting areas that could perhaps unwind a lot of what we need to know. One would be what is going on with the way that the metabolism compensates. For example, there is some indication that our metabolism is measuring certain macronutrients and there's some competition going on there. So it has a fat stat. 
So it knows and says, here's how much fat I have. How much fat do I need? By the way, we, this is relatively clear. We know this is probably having to do with leptin mechanics in the brain, being able to see, okay, this is how many calories we have stored on our body. But there's probably a protein stat as well in the way that we look at how much muscle mass we have on our body. And when you think about these two depots, one being a storage depot for amino acids, and some carbs in the form of glycogen, muscle, and uh, one being a storage form of fat, there looks like there might be some competition between these two things. And by the way, it looks like some of this might be programmed in utero. So this is one area that I would like to be teased out. For those of you who are very savvy here, this is commonly known as the protein sparing hypothesis, this idea that typically our body will measure its protein intake, measure how much protein it has on the body, and eat uh, to retain its protein. We see this in rats. We know this is true in rats where essentially if you feed a rat a low protein rat chow, they will continue eating that rat chow until they get their protein needs and then they stop. This may be going on uh, with humans. And so that's one area that I think is something I'd like to see teased out. I would also like to see what are the mechanisms involved with compensation? Why do some people seem to compensate with hunger cravings and energy decrements and slowed metabolic rates while others don't. Is this purely genetic? Is there an environmental component here? Is there something we can do to mitigate this? So that's another area I would teased out. This is some of the research by Herman Ponzer out of Duke University who's doing this work. Uh, and it's not 100% uh, clear yet. And then the final thing that I think is really interesting that uh, if you look out there in the blogosphere and you pay attention to what's going on social media, you would think we have this figured out. We really do not. And this is the microbiome and what's going on with the gut bugs and the signaling that happens. It looks and it's fascinating that the mitochondria, which is the end units of sort of energy production in our cells, are communicating somehow with the bacteria that are in our gut, which is really interesting because mitochondria are almost, we believe they're evolutionarily basically came from bacteria. So our eukaryotic cells basically incorporated mitochondria and they still have some bacteria-like tendencies. And so we know, for example, with compounds like urolithin A and other compounds that come from things like pomegranates and strawberries and things like that, gut bugs work on these compounds. They create other compounds that then go in the bloodstream, that then get into the cell, that then talk to the mitochondria, that then turn up or down or make the mitochondria less efficient or more efficient. This is another area that I think is absolutely fascinating. As a matter of fact, I just read a study this morning on kombucha, uh, which is uh, one of the first studies uh, done on humans where they had a double-blind placebo-controlled study in a small group of diabetics and showed that eight ounces of kombucha after four weeks uh, restored uh, blood sugar levels, not back to normal, but dropped blood sugar levels on average by about 70 uh, points for blood sugar and began to have a profound hypoglycemic effect. And they were looking at that this is probably coming from the mechanism of action of these bacteria present in kombucha. And so there's a lot more that we could potentially be paying attention to, but these are the areas that I think are hugely important. And I guess I would throw one more in there and that's circadian rhythm function. I was also yeah. reading another study this morning, basically looking at this idea that if it's pretty clear now that if you eat according to your circadian rhythm, you may be shutting down some of the hedonistic cravings and binge eating behavior. And that might be go back to what you and I were talking about previously about how, why do some people compensate and, one, and some people don't? Is it because their eating rhythm is off? And is this playing a, a key role? So as you can imagine, there's a whole lot more we need to understand, but these are the four areas of research that I really pay attention to because I think they have the biggest potential to uncover some useful information for us. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of that stuff too, there's, you can tell that they've been definitely focused on diving into that more. I know, for example, the, based on your, man, I can't think of the word right now, your, the timing of your nutrition, what you just said it, what is it? Yeah. Time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting type of stuff. Cir circadian, circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Circadian rhythm. I was thinking of cr chrono nutrition, but I guess that's basically the same thing. And I guess they've done a little bit of that, right? Where it's like, it, it like you said there, that is a big thing that probably 
people like some low hanging fruit potentially there where people might be overlooking that. Cause like, I'm sure you've seen this with people you work with where it's like, it's backwards in terms of, you know, what they say you should do, right. Where it's, Hey, you want to probably eat a little bit more earlier in the day and then a little bit less as the day goes on. But what you commonly see is the complete opposite where it's usually less during the day and then a lot more at night. Is that kind of on the same line of thought there with that? It is. Although we do have a lot of different cultures, historically and modern day cultures who tend to be fairly lean cultures who really do the opposite. Take the Spanish culture for instance. They're much less uh, obese than they're catching up to us, of course, in the United, in the United States and Canada and Australia. But the Spanish have huge meals at night, very late at night, and, and tend to not eat much in the morning. And so there seems to be these populations where that's not the case. But if you look at some of this research, it does seem to suggest all else being equal, at least in the studies, that uh, we might want to be consuming more uh, heavier calorie meals and more carbohydrate laden meals earlier in the day. And that might go along with insulin sensitivity and may play a role in hunger suppression and uh, weight loss. However, we can see even hunter-gatherer tribes, they tend to, a lot of hunter-gatherer tribes tend to do the exact opposite and stay very lean. Maybe it has to do with just the fact that they're not, they're still not overeating. So it does come back to calories. And this is why metabolism is really yep. confusing, right? Because if you really look, you might, this study says this, and then you can find exceptions to it everywhere. That's why we have to be very careful not to be mechanism chasers. A lot of people in this field will just find the, like, you know what it's like, Jeff, you find, you talk to someone and they just discovered the mechanism of insulin and fat storage, right? And then they go, insulin is everything, right? And until they realize that cortisol also can make you insulin resistant, to tell they realize that certain microbiotics in your microbiome can make you insulin resistant. And all of a sudden, and then they realize there's another hormone, ASP, which is triggered by fat, which can trigger insulin, right? We need to stop mechanism chasing. We need to understand the metabolism is incredibly complex. And one mechanism is not going to explain this. Yeah. And then too, on top of it, you come on here and you hear, oh, hey, so I should eat earlier in the day. But then obviously, like you said there, there are certain populations that maybe they do better eating later. So it, it is, it's, it's just a lot of information. And it, it sounds like, again, there it, we probably have a good idea. But again, at the end of the day, it needs to be individualized. And really, what can the person that's that we're working with, what what works for them, I would imagine. And I'm sure working at psychology, that's probably a big part of, that's another piece of all this as well too, not to just make it even more complicated. You have all the things going on from the metabolism standpoint, physiology, but then the psychology side of it is another uh, big piece of it as well too, with all this stuff. Yeah, actually, Jeff, to me, you said the most important thing, like we talked about four areas of research that we would want to look you to me, you actually covered right there in that statement, the most important thing about metabolism. We are each metabolically different. In fact, uh, when you start to get into this, we start to see that we're probably as metabolically unique as we are physically unique. We are very different metabolically. We know some of this now with the CGM studies where we basically take a group of people, we give them white bread. We used to think white bread was just terrible for all people. Some of these people have normal glucose responses and hunger suppression and do great on white bread. Other people have other things. And yes, individualized nutrition. Now, here's the problem with that. Research studies by their very nature are a tool for averages, not a tool for individuals. And so we have to actually begin to change the whole way we begin to do science to really understand and parse apart these individual aspects of things. It's partly why some people would say all of nutrition research is bullshit, right? And part of the reason they say that is because they go, most of these studies are population studies. They're built on correlations, not causations. And then even when you get down into these double-blind placebo-controlled studies, we're talking averages. There's always outliers. And how much can we translate this into all people? And so what I would say from a clinician point of view, right, because that's what you know I am. I assume that's what you are. Those of us who are coaches, trainers, we're essentially doing clinical work. And what I would say is that we really should be looking at the research to define our work, not or to refine our work, rather, not define our work. In other words, a lot of people go, I read this study. Now all of you, all of my clients should go and do that. Instead, they should be like, this might be useful for this particular client. It may be complete nonsense for someone else. And, and I'll just break this down the way I look at it. When you're doing metabolism work, uh, you need to look at what I call the four Ps, unique physiology, right? We talked about that with the way we might handle carbohydrates. Everyone's a little bit different. Unique psychology. We all know some people go through romantic heartbreak and they, they eat everything in sight. Other people go through romantic heartbreak and they can't eat anything, right? We all respond psychologically differently to stress. 
Also, our personal preferences matter a lot. Some people like beers and Brussels sprouts. Other people like chocolate and coffee. These things matter. And then, of course, practical circumstances. Some people live in food deserts. Some people have, like right here in Asheville, North Carolina, where I live, I've got a, a trail right next to my house and I've got Whole Foods a block away. Right. That's and I have the resources to eat at Whole Foods. This is what we need to be taking into account. What is the physiology, the psychology, the personal preferences and the practical circumstances of the person in front of us? And then we have to match those with, with what I call the four M's, which are our choices around this stuff, which is mindset and mindfulness. If the metabolism really is a stress barometer, then we better be paying very close attention to how we are managing and lowering stress. All the things that we do to lower stress, rest and recovery activities. This is where things like sauna therapies and cold plunges and walks through the park and sex and physical affection and time with pets and community and meditation and massage. This is where all that comes in. So mindset and mindfulness are first, then movement. And by movement, I don't mean exercise. I just mean that we're humans. We're built to move. We're not built to run, but we are built to walk. So are you a sitter or are you a mover? Next is meals, what we're eating. And finally is metabolics, what we're doing to stimulate the metabolism. This is where I would include exercise. This is where I would include drugs. This is where I'd include supplements. Now, when you think about the average person, they just go meals and metabolics, diet and exercise. And they miss arguably the two more important elements, which are mindfulness and stress reduction. And uh, mindset, which is all about how we perceive the world, is the world safe? Do I am I accepted? Do I belong? That kind of thing. And then movement. Am I moving? So most of the time, when I'm dealing with someone metabolism wise, I go, "All right, what are your four P's?" And then what are the four M's? And most of the time, I'm not having them do more diet and exercise. I'm having them do more movement and mindset and stress reducing activities. And I think these frameworks matter. And frameworks are really nice if you're a cl clinician or a trainer or a coach, because what they do is they allow structured flexibility. They give you a general structure in which to meet your client, but they allow you to be flexible and individualize things to that client. That's very different than what we hear a lot now, to be honest with you, which to me is a pet peeve of mine, evidence-based coaches. To me, evidence-based really has three components. One, do you know the research? Yes, that's important. But more importantly, do you know your client? And then are you intuitive enough and have enough clinical experience to say, you know what, I saw this in a particular client and I see this general trend and it's nowhere in the research, but I just, I just know that this, I think this will work. And most of the people who get results are going to be those types of people. So when we say evidence-based, most people don't even know what that means. Evidence-based has a definition. Evidence-based means know the research, know the client and the intuition and experience of the clinician who's doing the work. So to me, when you have that evidence-based background, you're going to use more of a structured flexibility type approach. You're not going to be just beholden to a new study. You're going to let that refine your approach for certain people, but it will not define your approach. Yeah. And I can totally relate to that too, because I, I, I've been doing this for probably six, seven years now. And I think when you first get started, you want to, you want the answer like, Hey, this is how you do it. This is the, the study says this is that's how you do it. And even like post on social media too, it can be easy to be like, Oh, what's this person going to say if I post this? But like you said, you really do need to rely on that experience and almost just trust your intuition there and kind of mold it with what you have seen that actually works uh, with people. But obviously, like you said, taking into to uh, taking the research into play as well, too, that's super important, but not just like being like, oh, hey, this is what the study says. This is how it exactly needs to be done. And I think that can be that's a tough thing to, to work through and, and, and get around. It, it really is. And I think that it, it really starts with the fact of it's like this, right? I oftentimes think to myself, talk about psychology. What's the major block for most humans? The major block to most humans and the major psychological virus that we deal with is what I would call duality thinking, right? It's basically this idea that this is wrong, this is right. This is hot, this is cold. You see it everywhere, right? This is the right way to eat. This is the wrong way to eat. One of the things that the best coach can do, and I would say people who are trying to change their body and change their health can do is release this duality thinking and become a non-dual thinker. And a non-dual thinker focuses a lot like a detective, right? They're interested. They're seeing it as a process. They're experimenting. It's this ongoing process versus a dieter, which goes, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And I don't know about you, Jeff, but I hear this all the time. I'm this probably I hear more than anything else. I'm doing everything right. 
and I'm still not getting results. And what I would say is that's a dualistic way of thinking, right? Yeah. What I say to that, and you know, I don't mean to be rude or, or flippant when I say this, but I go, if you're doing everything right and not getting results, then you're not doing everything right. And one of the things you're doing wrong is thinking in this dualistic right, wrong thing. Keto's right. V veganism is wrong. Veganism is right. Keto's wrong. High protein diets are wrong and high carb diets are right. This is partly what we are doing. Instead, we should be like, okay, I have a natural sort of inclination to be interested in this particular regime, but let's see if my metabolism likes it, right? Let's just explore. And to me, this is relatively easy to play detective with your metabolism, right? You, you got to look at biofeedback, right? Your body is sending you signals all the time, like things like sleep and hunger and mood and energy and cravings and exercise performance and exercise recovery and libido and menses and erections and digestive function and signs and symptoms like joint pains and headaches. By the way, I sum this up in a silly little acronym, SHMEC, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, cravings. If your SHMEC is in check, this means that your metabolism is probably not under duress and probably not under stress. That's the first thing you need to do. Get your schmeck in check. Second is, are you attaining or, and maintaining optimal body composition? Are you losing weight or maintaining the optimal body composition that you've achieved? And then finally, are your blood labs and vitals, things like HRV, things like blood sugar, things like hemoglobin A1C, things like cholesterol, kidney and liver function, are all those things moving in optimal directions? If you have those three things, if your schmeck is in check, your biofeedback's good, you're feeling vital. If you're achieving and or maintaining optimal body composition and all your blood labs and vitals are moving in optimal directions, then I don't care if you're living off cotton candy and chocolate bars. Now, you and I would agree that's probably not going to happen for hardly anyone on the planet. But theoretically, if it did, then that's the right diet for you. And so most people aren't approaching this like this. Instead, they're just going with a psychological bias or the latest book they read or the latest guru they, they dealt with or the latest podcast or the latest social media guru that they paid attention to. And they're just going, that's how it works. Meanwhile, a lot of these people are not getting results from this because they're not listening to their metabolism. They're outsourcing that information to someone else. And that's wrong, in no, my I'm opinion. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I definitely, I think the how you feel, like I, I try to explain that to clients is like how you feel like you need to be checking in. If you're, this is why we're always looking at like your hunger, like you said, the schmeck, right? And checking in on that because that is super important. That will tell you a lot where, and like you said there, people just neglect that aspect of it. They don't think about that. It's just, oh, hey, I'm not losing weight. I just need to drop my calories more. It's like, man, if you feel super hungry, you're already low energy. It's like, why do you, why do you think that's going to be the, the the right thing there? And I feel it's, yeah, it's just, that's just how it is. It's just ignore that, just push through it. And, but again, if that's in a good spot, you're feeling good. That will tell you a lot there if you really pay attention to that. So I love that schmeck. I think that's super important. And, and most people over, overlook that just what I've seen working with people too. Yeah. And here's another thought that, that we really, it's the elephant in the room, but very few people see the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is this entire industry primarily is designed for 20-something-year-olds who are concerned with vanity, who have relatively flexible metabolisms, and who are the ones who are dominating the gyms. And vanity is a very good motivator when you're in your 20s. And a lot of these people are the ones giving the advice. And so one of the things that I, that I am known for, funnily enough, is female metabolism and the endocrinology of what happens at menopause and how these hormonal fluctuations situations change and what are the differences i spent my whole career as a matter of fact trying to understand the biological differences between male and female metabolism these things matter and so not we talked about this idea that we're all different men and women are not the same biologically metabolically no duh it should be a no duh it it, it should be uh, but a young woman and a young man is not the same as a more mature man and a more, more mature woman. When a guy's going through andropause and losing some of his testosterone or a woman is going through menopause and losing progesterone and estrogen, these things play a role. And yet the entire industry still acts like we're young 20 somethings who have flexible metabolisms and love to work out. And that's what the conversation is dominated by. Uh, and I got news for everyone. We, we should know this still in the culture that we're in. It's no longer that 20 year old being in your 20s just assumes you're in good shape. We're all getting fatter. We're all getting uh, less healthy. Why is that? We don't know, as Jeff and I talked about. We don't really know, to be honest. However, we I would say that a large reason we can't respond to diet and exercise is because we're not individualizing it. And so that, to me, is critically 
important because no one for me, okay, yeah, it's nice having a six pack and it's nice when I get a little bit leaner, but that doesn't motivate me. What motivates me is feeling better, functioning better, perhaps living longer. And by the way, for all the coaches listening to this, when you look at your goal sets of people, it always comes down to four things. Look good, look good, feel good, function better, live longer. That's the reason people do this stuff to begin with. And once you pass your 20s and start getting out into your mid 30s, looking good starts taking a back seat. And that's why a lot of people start losing their motivation. It's just a pet peeve of mine to say coaches who are in their 20s, they're great. It's not that they're not knowledgeable. It's also just check in and see if they're speaking only from the perspective of vanity and or they're you know, wrapped up in this dualistic thinking that will tell you if that's someone that you want to pay close attention to or not. They should be aware of the differences between young metabolisms and older metabolisms, the differences between male and female metabolisms, and they should have a healthy respect for the individual. Then they're doing real evidence-based medicine. And yes, they should know some of the research around circadian rhythm and fasting and all this kind of stuff and the basics of training and overload and progressive resistance and stuff like that. But in general, if they're a, a dualistic vanity person, that might not be someone you want to pay that much attention to, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. I think I definitely at the age, it's like you, you can't do the same thing you did when you were in your 20s either. Things are going to change there. So that's important. And like you said, making sure somebody understands that and then understanding that, that the metabolism is individual is, is is super important. We've been hitting a lot on the metabolism. So was there anything that like maybe we missed on what is metabolism? I feel like you, you summed it up pretty well with everything we've been talking about. And then maybe mm-hmm. is there anything else that maybe people get wrong with metabolism and the thought process around it? Yeah, I think the number one thing that I think people should remember from my perspective is that stop looking at metabolism as calories and hormones. Stop looking at diet as quantity and quality. It's both calories and hormones. It's both quantity and quality. And and the determinant of which is more important is going to depend on the individual. That's the first thing I would say. I'd also say that one of the things if we're talking about body composition that people don't understand. If the metabolism is a stress barometer, measuring stress and responding to that stress, then we need to understand some of the basic forms of stress. So this is critical in understanding metabolism from my point of view. What is the one stress that the metabolism historically has had to deal with for the hundreds of thousands or millions of years as humans have been evolving? 200,000 for Homo sapien, right? But then all of our ancestors prior to that, but starvation primarily. So what happens is in my way of looking at this, and of course, this is far from complete and could be more wrong than, but like I said, we don't know a whole lot. So here's my major guess. And I think it proves itself clinically and you can see whether you agree with me or not. If starvation was the major stress that we encountered as our metabolism evolved, then we are still programmed largely for starvation. So any stress we encounter, whether it be heartbreak, traffic, deadline at work, any of these things, there's going to be some level of a stress reaction meant to deal with starvation. This is why hunger changes. This is why energy changes. This is why cravings change. This is why sleep becomes fragmented with any kind of stress. Now, if we understand that, then, and we want to look at body composition, think about the gap between calorie intake and output, right? So if you eat less and exercise more, and that gap between calorie intake and output grows, that's a stress. That calorie gap is a stress and vice versa on the other side. If you eat more and move less, the calorie gap grows. Dieters and couch potatoes both have a large calorie gap coming from the opposite directions. Both of those are a stress. When you're eating way too much and not moving, that calorie gap creates a stress in the physiology. When you're exercising way too much and not eating, that calorie gap creates a stress in the physiology. How do we know? Because both of those people, the chronic dieter and the chronic couch potato, both have issues with what? Sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. Both of them have schmeck out of check. They're both starving. They're both, one is overfed and undernourished and they're starving. And the one is underfed and undernourished and they're starving, right? And Schmeck goes out of check. And so one of the things I think is useful here is just to think about one of the first moves you can make if you're trying to help a client with a dysfunctional metabolism is to narrow that calorie gap. So instead of thinking of eat less, exercise more, or eat more, exercise less, think about eat less, exercise less. Think about eat more, exercise more. 
Think about an athlete, right? An athlete, no athlete in his or her right mind eats less and exercises more. They eat more and they exercise more. And so this calorie gap narrowing, eat less, exercise less, eat more, exercise more. This is probably where we, what we need to be thinking about. If I think if we hadn't discussed that, then we're going to miss some things because that creates a situation where the metabolism doesn't go, oh my gosh, I'm in starvation mode. This calorie gap is getting too big. That's a stress for my physiology. Let me react with uh, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and craving. Schmeck out of check. Instead, what I have found clinically is that when I narrow that calorie gap, I can do a ton of good. So if I have someone who loves the exercise, but I see that they might be under eating, I just raise their food to match their, in and all of a sudden, they're going, I'm eating more and I'm losing weight. I'm like, that's right, because we took stress off the system and vice versa, right? I have someone who doesn't want to exercise at all, then I have to decrease their food intake. And all of a sudden, right, they start losing weight. Usually with that eat less, exercise less, it's usually eat less, move more, exercise less, right? In other words, everyone's yeah. got to move. But I would say that's the thing that we need to keep in mind. And those might be some of the things that most people listening to this would be completely unaware of and, and probably something you and I should cover. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's super, that's super important to, to cover, right? It's like on both ends of the spectrum there, there's that stress going on. It's not just somebody that's overweight. It's not somebody that's just underweight. It's both of those are, they're both stressors uh, on the body. And then is there anything else? So I, I think that's important for people to know. Is there anything else that maybe people get wrong about uh, metabolism before we move on to, uh, I know you had, and you hit on it, but metabolic prehab, I think that's going to be super cool to chat about. So yeah. And actually, that's what I was going to say. The one thing yeah. that people get wrong is they go from this idea of I'm just going to go from a couch potato to a crossfitting paleo person overnight. That is an extreme stress to the physiology. This is not what needs to happen. So this covers, I think, what the term that I have been using for a very long time now, at least over 10 years, I have been doing something that I now term metabolic prehab. What this is essentially like spring training for the metabolism. You don't take an athlete and go, all right, you haven't been, you've been on your off season. Now you're going to have your first game tomorrow. No, there's a whole ramp up spring training. There's a whole preseason. There's a whole conditioning period. We don't do this to the metabolism. Now, what would prehab look like? It's actually pretty simple. And it's actually when people ask me what to do, I could tell them in a very quick, when I'm in an elevator, and the elevator pitch, I go <laughs> stop eating junk food and start walking more. Just those things. It's as simple as that. Stop eating junk food. Start walking more. You don't need to fast. You don't need to keto. You don't need to do anything like that. You just need to stop eating packaged junk food. That's going to kill a ton of calories if you just can do that. And by the way, that's incredibly hard, right? So that's incredibly hard, but stop eating junk food. Most people know what junk food is, right? We don't have to worry about rice and potatoes, for most right. people, what we need to worry about is Snickers bars and Cinnabons. Stop eating junk food. Start walking. This is the simplest way to do metabolic prehab. What that begins to do is that immediately begins to restore some insulin sensitivity, some metabolic flexibility. I usually do that for four to six weeks for people. Now, if you want to get a little bit more fancy, you add a good quality metabolic multiple vitamin. You might say, Jay, what's a metabolic multiple vitamin? Just one that has all the precursors, all the B vitamins in the in their proper form. Maybe some that have alpha lipoic acid, take some extra magnesium, some vitamin D, right? Some of these things that we know people are relatively deficient in because they're eating all this junk food. And there's other things you can do as well, but that's the big one. Get some vitamin D on board, start taking a multivitamin, go for walks and stop eating junk food. And what happens is that is easy said, relatively tough to do. But after four to six weeks of that, then people feel better. They're sleeping better. Their motivation is up. Now they're ready for the gym. Now they're ready for me to say, okay, do you want to take it a little bit further? Now let's begin to, hey, let's move you to mostly green vegetables and protein. And now maybe I start counting protein grams with them. Something very simple, not like counting all the macros, just protein grams. Why? Because that's a big mover in terms of uh, yeah. crushing down hunger and also making sure they maintain their muscle as they lose weight. So now they're feeling even better. And so to me, it's just this very easy, what I call metabolic prehab. Walking is the major component of this. 
cutting out all this junk food and then slowly but surely adding on some more and more rather than just saying, you're going to start, take someone who's completely overweight, hasn't exercised in years, and I want you fasting and working out five days per week. Good luck with results right. on that person. It will, it will last for a little bit if or a week and then it, and then it's going to be tough to sustain and everything. So it sounds like that was from like the overweight side of things. They're on that one side of the stress where it's consuming a lot, not moving them more. So for you, it's, hey, let's just cut out some of that junk food. Let's get you moving more. Do that for a little bit, get things rolling in the right direction and then start to make it not complicated, but just add in more of the, the other stuff. What about on the other side of the spectrum? You have the person that is on the other side where they're exercising a ton, um, not eating a lot. And like for them, it's okay. I, I, like you said, they'll tell you, hey, I'm doing all the right things. Why am I not leaning mm -hmm. out? Stuff like that. Yeah. Metabolic prehab, right? Metabolic yep. rehab. So prehab. there's metabolic prehab for the person who is just been the couch potato and hasn't been doing anything. You ease them in slow. Metabolic rehab, you have to back them back out. And there's several moves here with metabolic rehab. So from my perspective, the term metabolic damage is really a tricky term because people don't like it. I love it because I love marketing terms like this that my client can understand. We can call it neuroendocrine immune dysfunction, which is what we would call it in the medical world. And they're going to be like, what the hell did you just say? So we just say it's metabolic damage, right? It's And you have to clarify this. There's nothing damaged in your metabolism. It didn't break. It's just doing what it's designed to do. And what it's designed to do is put a governor on. Like those school buses go around that don't go 80 miles per hour because they put a governor on the engine and don't allow it to go past. That's what your metabolism has essentially done. It has a governor effect now. Your This calorie gap needs to change. Now, do you love exercise? Yes, I do. Then you need to eat more. Uh, are you so exhausted? Now that you and, and so hurt, beat up that you can't exercise, then you need to eat less. So this is where you move people into either eat less, exercise less, or eat more, exercise more. And to me, this goes in stages. So we can break this down. In the beginning, what happens is when someone over exercises and under eats for a long period of time, they move into metabolic compensation first. Right. And metabolic compensation is just what Jeff and I were talking about. It's Schmeck goes out of check and weight loss stalls or reverses right? So metabolic compensation comes first. It's very easy to deal with metabolic compensation from a rehab perspective. If they're eating less and exercising more, then all you have to do is really move them into any other toggle. You can have them eat more, exercise less for a few days. That can do it, right? It's like a refeed. You can have them eat more, eat and exercise more. That will get them moving again. Or you can have them eat less, exercise less. So when someone is in metabolic compensation, all you have to do is just move them into a metabolic toggle. And just so we're clear, to me, I see there's four metabolic toggles. There's the ones we're used to, eat less, exercise more, and eat more, exercise less. And then there's the two that Jeff and I just introduced to everyone, which is eat more, exercise more, and eat less, exercise less. So the first metabolic rehab thing is when stage one, if they're in metabolic compensation, just move them into eat less, exercise less, eat more, exercise more, or eat more, exercise uh, less. And that's usually going to get them right out of that. Now, stage two, when they keep going is what I would call metabolic resistance. Now, what happens is it's not just compensation. It's the metabolism is digging its heels in even more. What happens here? Either you stop losing weight or now you're gaining and or you are plateaued and you're just miserable, right? This is where you start seeing sleep becomes an issue. Mood becomes an issue. Libido becomes an issue. So with metabolic compensation, it's usually hunger and cravings and a slowed metabolic rate. With metabolic resistance, you start seeing sleep and mood start to be an issue as well. You start seeing libido and menses start to become an issue. Here, what you want to do is only choose probably eat less, exercise less is where you're going to have to go. They're going to have to take some time off, ease back on the eating, and that is going to begin to jiggle them off that. Now, the final stage is what I would call metabolic dysfunction. Metabolic dysfunction is when now you start seeing real diagnostic signs and symptoms. You, you one, of the, one of the ones you usually really see is thyroid-related dysfunction. You may even see it show up, subclinical uh, thyroid uh, symptoms, uh, cold intolerance, wanting to sleep all the time, getting this puffy look where they eat a little bit of carbs and they look like they blow up like a helium balloon. And to me, again, this is eat less, exercise less is what's going to have to happen for a time. And eventually that can go to metabolic disease. So it's metabolic composition, compensation, rather metabolic resistance, metabolic dysfunction. And then the final stage is metabolic disease, where now they're diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or some kind of condition that now we have to use medications and or 
supplements. But the fix is in stage one, just move them to a different toggle. In stage two and three and four, this is where we have to move to eat less, exercise less, and institute more and more functional medicine uh, sort of therapies. Uh, and, and this is how it works. Now, a lot of coaches will uh, go to this uh, place where they go, oh, you just need to eat. You're not seeing it. You just need to eat more and, and exercise less. And this is oftentimes the worst thing to do when you're in stage three and four or two, three and four of metabolic damage. And the reason why is because their metabolism is now at a snail's pace. Yeah. And you're saying, hey, let's eat more and exercise less. They're going to blow up like a helium balloon. And by the way, I would say that these people who are really far along in metabolic dysfunction, oftentimes there is a period where they're going to have to gain a little bit of weight to begin to see uh, results again. And just really uh, fast, I'll give you guys since we went through this whole thing. But for me, eat less, exercise less is it's like the hunter gatherer model. Hunter gatherers aren't out there doing like metabolic conditioning and heaving weights around. They walk a lot. They eat very little. Right. So you can live in that indefinitely. You can also think of it as the, the traditional Parisian lifestyle, the, the European lifestyle. So you can live there indefinitely. Eat more, exercise more is something that works good for about you know, training blocks, three months or so, eight to 12 weeks. Eat, eat more, exercise less, no more than four days. If you're training really hard, a, a long weekend where you just eat and refeed can be beneficial for you, but you probably don't want to do more than four days or so. And eat less, exercise more. By the way, after you've rehabbed and prehabbed your metabolism, eat less, exercise more will work and it can work really well, but it only works well for about seven to 14 days. And then you're going to want to ease off of it a little bit. So hopefully that gives you some clinical pearls uh, that can guide you a little bit. Yeah, no, that's all, all that's super helpful. I had a couple of questions that uh, came off that. So like when you say eat less, what, what does that look like? Because I could see somebody taking that and be like, oh, okay, I just need to like, again, not eat, just eat super low calorie. Is that kind of what you're talking about by that? Or what, what does eat less look like? Yeah, there's two. There's, I'm so glad you asked this question because there's really two ways to look at eat less, right? You can eat less calories, but with that, you can eat more volume. Think about it. If you just ate lean chicken breast and broccoli, you'd be eating a huge volume of food right. and it would be a very low calorie diet. And it's a lower calorie diet, usually when I talk about eat less, the e easiest way to think about this. And, and, and how low do we know? We don't know how low, but typically I like to start people pretty low, right? And here's what's interesting is that when you stop exercising like crazy and you decrease your calories and ramp up your percent of protein. So what I normally do is bring people's protein levels up while I bring the calories down as a percent up to 40% or so. So I'm 225 pounds. I usually just use a general rule for most people uh, times 10. So 2,250 calories is what I'd bring myself down to. And I'd ramp my protein levels up to about 40% or one gram per pound of body weight. Right. And what this does is allows me to go pretty low calorie while also not losing muscle and shutting down hunger. And typically I use as a starting place, your body weight in pounds times 10. So I forgive you for those people who live in Europe and other places, just do that conversion. But that's how I typically measure that. And I also say three meals or less per day. This is where fasting can work well, things like that. Eat more. Eat more is typically 15 times your body weight. Now, if you're a hard gainer, it's 20 times your body weight. And at this point, eating more, I put the protein at about 30% of macronutrients and I ramp carbohydrates up. So you have those extra carbs. So I, it's usually a 40, 30, 30 macronutrient ratio with eat more, exercise more, because you need those extra carbs to drive some of that intense uh, training you're doing. And if you look at this, Jeff, it's really interesting, right? Because this is there's no magic here. Most people, they're hearing this and they'd go, I do this naturally anyway. On days that I don't train, I tend to do an eat less, exercise less approach. On days I do train, I tend to do an eat more, exercise more approach, right? Isn't that how it works? A lot of people nowadays just naturally eat less on the days they don't train and naturally eat more on the days they do train or naturally eat more when they're going through a training block and naturally eat a little bit less, uh, when they're not. And that's because for the vast majority of people, based on the research, probably about 75% of people, the amount of exercise they do is directly correlated with how hungry they feel. There is also about a 25% uh, of people who can ramp up their exercise like crazy and still don't need to eat. They don't get that hunger response. And these are the people that a lot of women hate. There's actually an interesting study on perimenopausal, menopausal women, the alpha and beta trials, where they basically took women and they had them do cardiovascular training. They said, don't change your diet at all. And they had three groups. One group was 30 minutes of uh, treadmill running basically five days per week. The third, the second group was 45 minutes of treadmill running five days per week. And the other group was 60 minutes of treadmill running five days per week. And they followed them for a year. 
right? So these are, that's a lot of cardio. And they said, don't make any changes consciously to your diet. About 25% of those women lost weight. About 50% of those women stayed relatively stable, up a little bit, down a little bit. And another 25% actually gained weight. And you go, so that's 75% of people roughly who really didn't see much change or actually gained weight. Why? Because compensation. They ramped up their activity, their hunger went up with it, and it went up. And by the way, we live, we now live in a world where our hunter guy, their ancestors could find some blueberries, maybe some honey, but they were basically eating lean antelope and fibrous vegetables. They weren't going to get 2,000 calories in a day, right. even if they tried, unless they got lucky. Whereas we can take one meal at the Cheesecake Factory and there we are doing 4,000 calories in a day, right? Just based on one meal. And this is why this happens. Maybe in the, if we were all hunter gatherers living off the land, this could never happen. But the world we live in now, it happens. We compensate and we overeat and we can wipe out any calories calories burned through exercise and or overcome those calories and actually gain weight. And I'm sure too, some of this comes down to those people that exercise more. It's probably the, the, like, and you, you may have hit on this. It's probably the intensity of it. That's the the issue too, right? It's not necessarily like you said, they're like hunter gatherer. Like they're not, they never were, like you said, doing Metcons and like trying to train super intensely. They were just moving a lot, but it wasn't mm -hmm. ever anything super like intense or, or anything like that. And so I'm assuming yeah. that probably plays a big role uh, in that as well too. Yeah. It's very astute. And actually we don't have all the research is mixed on this, but in general, my reading of the research, which me and you might be talking in a year and we can refine some of this because it's always iffy. But right now my reading of the research essentially says short and tense exercise is probably gives you hunger suppression in the short term. We all know this too, right? If you do really yeah. intense short workouts, you can even get nauseous, right? You just don't want to eat for a while. And then, so there's this delay of hunger that happens, which gives you some time to get some protein on board to delay that hunger. A long duration cardio, like these women were doing, seems to be the one that may be triggering most of the hunger responses. And then walking, which is very low, seems not to do that much. And weight training, seems not to do that much unless it's very long and intense. So if you want to control hunger, it's probably very low intensity stuff like walking and or very short, intense stuff like interval training or 20 minute workouts or met cons and things like this that last for a short period of time. As soon as those things start going over 30, 40 minutes or you're doing very long duration, moderate intensity stuff, probably we're going to start seeing some hunger responses. Now, one of the other things that throws a wrench in this is that people who tend to be well-trained tend to uh, actually have a better hunger craving response. People who are well-trained, the same thing with cortisol, right? People make a big deal about cortisol levels being elevated with intense training, but people who are conditioned tend to have blunted cortisol responses uh, to some degree. And, uh, and by the way, when I think of cortisol, there's a lot of indication in the research, although this is controversial too, that cortisol and cravings go hand in hand. So walking and short intense weight training from my perspective, is probably the better way to do this. Now, we may see that I'm wrong about that at some point in the research, but right now I, I'm pretty confident those are probably the ways to go if you want to control hunger effects. And it just comes back to what we talked about earlier, I feel like too, where it's like, again, that individual response to it is also super important, like how the individual is responding to it. Like a, a client case here with this. So somebody that like, maybe they're not exercising a ton. They're not like moving a ton. Um, they're not really eating a lot either, but they're like stuck in the spot where like they just can't drop down. Do you think that it ends up coming down to somewhere along the lines, like even if they're tracking their food, doing stuff, it's like somewhere along the lines, they're probably eating some maybe calorie dense foods or meals that eventually they're just eating more than they think they are. And that's probably the issue here with this because I'm sure that's what you see a lot with people as well too where it's they're good good they're hitting their macros whatever for five six days out of the week pretty low calorie they're like why am I not dropping weight and then they have those one to two days in there that they're not really tracking they're just doing whatever the hell they want and you hit on it you can go to the cheesecake factory and get 4,000 calories do you feel like that's where uh, you see a lot of people end up falling into this even though they think that they're like on track with it. And they like, why, what's going on here? Yeah. People don't want to hear this, but yes, absolutely. And, and it's like the psychological licensing, right? If you're on a diet and you're creating, let's say a 200 calorie deficit per day for five days and you're eating clean, right? So you got a thousand calorie deficit right there. And you're like five days, I did good. But then you go to cheesecake factory and you consume 2000 extra calories in your mind. You go, I ate good for five days and I only ate bad for one day. Your metabolism doesn't work like that. It just sees the fact that you can over consume for the week. 
And you see this a lot with women with menses where they're good for three weeks and then eat like crazy during menses. So yes, this is going on. And not to mention the fact that even when people are, we know from the research that even food labels are about 20% off. We also know that when scientists watch people track their foods over time, after about four weeks to six weeks, people miss about 30% of their calories. That's a whole meal per day. So yes, this is very real. And this is where we can, we can with the bros, the, the evidence-based bros who are always calories. This is where we could say they got a point. They really have a point because this is not teased out. And this is who knows how much it is, but I think this is happening with the vast majority of people. I, I really do. Th this is happening with the vast majority of people. And part of it is because of the hunger responses and everything else that they're doing. But this is really what matters. Yes, calories matter. We must pay attention to those. And the modern day, and just because we ate good for five days or three weeks, doesn't mean we can't wipe all that out in one weekend or in one week. Yeah, because that I, I I think people are shocked. At, are they? I don't, I don't know, shocked, but I I think they don't understand how quickly you can in today's world you can just get so many calories without even really realizing it, right? I'm sure you I'm sure you agree with us, but three thousand calories, for example, like you said, it's like people are like, oh, I don't eat that much. There's no way, but it's man, if you're drinking a little bit, you're going out to eat, that can get, get up there super quickly with the stuff they put butter, oil, stuff like that, and everything else uh, that they yeah. Think put about in the it, alcoholic there. beverage. Typical alcoholic beverage is 200 calories, right? Think about that. So you go out with your friends on a weekend, let's say you have three drinks each day. And that's moderate for a lot of people. Most people are doing a little bit more than that. That is thousands of calories just in alcohol. Meanwhile, you ate extra meals and all that kind of stuff as well. This is 1000% going on. Some people would argue it's everything that's going on. It's the whole reason. And they might be right. They actually might be right. We just don't know for sure. But just like you, my guess is this is a big piece of it. But what I would say is the, the fix to this is yes, paying attention, but also getting control of our hedonistic tendencies. Yeah. Some of the hedonistic, highly palatable foods make us want to eat more, right? That's a big piece of it. Eating off our circadian rhythm. We just talked about research. That might be a role. Exercising too much and too intensely, that could cause some of this hedonistic behavior. So our drive for food is a certainly being driven by things that we're not aware of. And then add on to that, our inability to calculate calories correctly over time. And you see the problem. What does, in, in your opinion, what does uh, like lean body mass muscle play? Like how big of a role does it play in all of this? What are your kind of thoughts around that? Yeah, it to me, it plays a huge role. Although I think that we have to, that's my bias. If you really look at the research to me, it seems to play its role in uh, when we lose weight, and then how much we have regained compensation back, right? Uh, that's where I think it plays its biggest role. And so I think it is huge, but I also see an awful lot of people who are big burly dudes who are muscle fat. I tend to get that way. I gain fat easily. I gain muscle easily. And it plays a role, but it, it's not going to be the end all be all in terms of protecting you from obesity. You're still going to have to play this game. What I will say though, is this resistance training from my perspective, is the only exercise that we have that when you do it, it burns some calories, by the way, much less than most other forms of activity. However, uh, in the hours after you burn more calories to recover in the day after that, you burn more calories to repair. And in the day after that, you burn more calories to adapt. It's the only exercise that gives you, it keeps on giving. So I think partly the benefit of resistance training is that short-term effects versus that I put on 10 pounds of muscle and I'm burning thousands more calories. The, the research is only that you burn something like six extra calories per pound of body weight at rest or for per pound of muscle that you gain at rest. It becomes beneficial once you start to move it, right? Move that's it, yeah. when you start, that's when extra muscle with extra movement is really what we're talking about here. Yeah. No, you, you make a good point there that obviously it's not going to protect you against weight gain. Like you still obviously are going to have to control your cork intake with that and just moderate your food intake around that. But yeah, I'm just curious because I feel like a lot of people maybe underestimate, they, they underestimate the importance of the weight training side of things just overall. And they just focus on just like the, the fat loss and like weight loss side of things. And I just was seeing your thoughts on that. Cool. Is there anything else that maybe we missed or that you want to uh, go over before uh, I let you go over at the, the top of the hour here? No, I think we covered a ton. This yep. is a really good interview. And I thank you for asking these questions because it really allowed a really good discussion. But I think we were pretty, pretty thorough. Just one other thing that I would add here that's a very trivial thing is water intake. And so to me, uh, if you're going to, if, if we're going to make some very simple things, 
water intake, protein intake, fiber intake on the diet side. Diet drives the fat loss. And then resistance training on the exercise side. That makes sure that you don't lose muscle and there's not going to be some compensatory weight regain. Like in general, if we're going to start to say what are the primary principles of food, it's low calorie, hunger suppressing, nutrient dense, tasty enough, but not too tasty types of food. And it's resistance training on the exercise side. And I think that's a really good take home for most people. Awesome. Thanks, Jade. Yeah, a ton, ton of great information in here. It's really cool to hear your thoughts on this. And you can tell you have a ton of experience in this field. And just, I, th I think the frameworks are super helpful too. And a lot of people will take a lot away from that. Before I let you go, is there anywhere where you want to leave the audience to or anything like that? Yes, I, I uh, jadetita.com if you want more of my work at jadetita on social media. And I have a podcast as well called the Next Level Human Podcast. If you listen to this podcast and you were like, man, I want more of this information, Next Level Metabolism is a book of mine that would, would cover all of this stuff. Next Level Metabolism, jadetita.com at jadetita. Yeah, see the uh, nice little picture back there in, in your background there of the, uh, is it, that's a podcast? The next yeah, that's my podcast. And, again, cool. and we cover uh, psychology, health and fitness, everything that has to do with the four jobs. So finance, health, wealth, personal relationships, and purpose and meaning. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's cool to, to have that extra, the not just the fitness, nutrition stuff in there, have some other uh, aspects in there too. So awesome, Jade. Well, again, appreciate your time, man. And we'll talk to you next time. Appreciate you, brother.